Thank you all so much for having me this afternoon. Nothing like putting the geeky scientist right behind the professional musician and entertainer. No pressure, I understand. Um, today, I'm going to talk about antibiotic resistance. And if they're good, they'll bring up my slides. Um, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health crises in the United States and globally right now. I'm going to talk to you about why it's a problem, how important antibiotics are to you as an individual, to your families, to our community, what they've done for medical care, what antibiotic resistance is, how it happens, why it's a problem, and what we have to do to stop this problem. I'm going to make a call to action that I need each and every one of you to understand and participate in if we're going to be able to reduce the transmission of antibiotic resistance in the future. So let me start with a story. This is my dad, actually, who enrolled, um, enlisted in the military when he was 17. He lied about his age. He actually shipped out of this very train station to join World War II. He's with my grandfather. And when he was in Japan, he developed pneumonia, collapsed, and had to be shipped to a military hospital. He was near death. He was saved by two doses of penicillin. They got him back on his feet, sent him to find his troops, which he did. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for antibiotics. And I suspect many of you wouldn't be here either. Now, fast forward, if we think about, it wasn't just my dad. There were many soldiers um, during World War II who survived because of the advent of penicillin. Penicillin was called a miracle drug because it was the first antibiotic we had that actually could kill bacteria, reduce their replication. It prevented war wounds from turning into gangrene, amputations, and death. So there were thousands of soldiers who survived because of penicillin. Penicillin was initially so valuable and so rare that we recycled soldiers' urine to collect the penicillin back, purify it so we could use it in other people. OK, we're frozen here. This is extra tricky. These are my parents in their 80s. So fast forward 65 years, and my dad got pneumonia again when he was 80. But this time, nobody would dream of treating somebody with penicillin, with pneumonia for penicillin. He had to be treated with two very broad spectrum antibiotics, and he had a drug-resistant haemophilus that caused his pneumonia and sepsis. He recovered, but then he developed another drug-resistant infection methicillin-resistant staph aureus, which has become a real problem in hospitals and in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, antibiotic resistance is a huge storm, and it's in our backyard. It's going to overcome us and be everywhere if we don't turn the tide. A decade ago, Tony Fauci, who's the head of the infectious disease branch at the National Institute of Health, said that Mankind is at war with the microbial world, a resilient foe that can never be defeated. He said this because bacteria are programmed to survive. They're among the earliest life forms. They've been around since the beginning of time, and they completely mutate to survive and evolve. Now, this is the enemy. We are now plagued with tremendous increases in antibiotic-resistant organisms, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, clostridium difficile diarrhea, E. coli, and simple bacteria that we used to be able to treat with just a couple antibiotics, common bacteria that cause pneumonia and urinary tract infections, now are killing people because we don't have effective antibiotics that can treat them. Now, not all bacteria are bad. There are helpful bacteria and harmful bacteria. Bacteria are everywhere around us, and they're part of our normal, everyday life. In your skin, in your mouth, in your gut, are tens of trillions of microorganisms. You actually have more microorganisms in you and more bacterial cells than you have human cells in your body. And they're important to keep you healthy. They influence your metabolism. They help you with digestion. 
but they cause problems when they overgrow, when they invade parts of your body where they're not supposed to be, and then they cause infections. Now, today I'm going to talk about bacterial resistance and antibiotics. There's also important problems with drug resistance against antiviral drugs and against fungal drugs as well. But today I'm just going to talk about bacterial infections. So many common conditions like the common cold, influenza, athlete's foot are not treated by antibiotics. Cold, flu, those are viruses. Athlete's foot is a fungus. We're focusing on bacterial infections. Bacterial organisms are living microorganisms that can replicate in the environment, in animals, plants, and in people. So things like strep throat are bacteria, bacterial pneumonia, urinary tract infections are generally caused by bacteria and need to be treated with antibiotics. If they don't, there are very serious consequences and people can die. So, once penicillin was invented, they actually led to the development of subsequent antibiotics like cephalosporin, streptomycin, lots of different classes of antibiotics that worked even better than penicillin for many different kinds of bacterial infections. Antibiotics saved more lives in the first 15 years of their development than all other medical technologies over the next 45 years. Antibiotics allowed the development of complex surgery, like heart surgery, total joint replacements, and cancer chemotherapy, which wouldn't have been possible if you didn't have antibiotics to treat the infections. So this has been great, right? We've developed all these antibiotics. They're newer, more powerful, more expensive. They kill off lots of different kinds of bacteria. Well, the problem is that bacteria are programmed to survive. So they develop resistance and mutate to every antibiotic we've developed. And this shouldn't have been surprising. So Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin many years ago, figured out in the lab very early on that if you use too low of a dose of penicillin, or if you give intermittent doses of penicillin, the bacteria quickly become very resistant. So he said an ignorant man runs the risk of underdosing himself, making the bacteria resistant and rendering penicillin ineffective in the future for everyone else. So antibiotics are like no other drug. If you misuse your blood pressure medicine or you misuse your statins for your heart disease, it doesn't impact their effectiveness in other people. If you misuse antibiotics and you get a drug-resistant organism, then you can pass that to your family and your community so the drug's no longer infective for anybody else. So let me show you how bacteria become resistant. This is an illustration of a bacteria. It has a cell wall. It has genetic material in the middle. And usually, antibiotics work by either breaking up the cell wall or interfering with replication. But the bacteria are really smart. So when the antibiotics come in, they develop enzymes that can break up the antibiotic. They develop molecules that bind to the antibiotic so it's no longer effective. And they make little sump pumps to dump the antibiotics right out of the cell again. So now there are hundreds and hundreds of enzymes that make antibiotics ineffective. So for every antibiotic we've developed, there's resistance. So this is how it works. When you take an antibiotic, these are bacteria. And the green bacteria are sensitive to antibiotics, and the red bacteria are the resistant ones. So you take the antibiotic, it kills off all the sensitive bacteria. That leaves you only with resistant bacteria in your gut or in your body. And they replicate and they replicate until they're the predominant strain. And you're colonized now with resistant bacteria, not something simple to treat, something that may be incurable, incredibly difficult to treat. Now, we used to think about antibiotic-resistant organisms as really being a problem only in the hospital or in ICUs. It wasn't in the community. But really, antibiotic-resistant organisms are everywhere. They're in the community. They're in the farm. They're with your pets and they're transmitted, we're all a part of one ecosystem. This is one health. Animal health and people health is all linked. The antibiotics that people take influence their resistance and in animals as well. Now, we love our antibiotics. 
In the United States, we write 25 antibiotic prescriptions per thousand people. Now, that's two and a half times the number that are prescribed in the Netherlands. We're not two and a half times as sick as they are. We're just using antibiotics inappropriately, and the Netherlands is way ahead in stewarding this precious resource to make sure they're used appropriately. So 50% of antibiotics are unnecessary or inappropriately used. 90% of the time when people go to the doctor for a cold, they don't need antibiotics, they, but they often get antibiotics. And 90% of kids' doctor's visits for ear infections also are usually caused by viruses and don't need antibiotics. Now, I love cows, but the biggest problem for antibiotic use is not our use of antibiotics in humans, it's in livestock and agriculture. So 70 to 80 percent of all the antibiotics that are used in this country are used for growth promotion and prophylaxis in animals. That's when you put antibiotics in the food and water of livestock to make them grow faster and to try to prevent infections. What that leads to is incredible increases in resistance. All of those animals then have antibiotic-resistant organisms. They pass them into the environment, and then they get passed on to fruits, to vegetables, to other animals and wildlife, and to you through your food. So this is a real problem that's impacting real people like you and your family members in our community. So these resistant organisms are the same organisms that are the most common cause of urinary tract infections. Probably a third of the people in the room have had a urinary tract infection. It's the most common infection in women. But now, instead of a single pill or a couple days worth of pills to give you, I may have to give you IV antibiotics. You may have to be in the hospital or be on antibiotics for a prolonged period of time. And then that leads to more resistance, so you can get a horrible organism like C. diff, which is a predominant cause of antibiotic-resistant diarrhea right now. So I could show you 50 graphs of the relentless increase in antibiotic resistance all across the world. I just picked a couple to demonstrate. This is C. diff. It doesn't care if you're black or white, rich or poor, have health insurance or not. It's an equal opportunity infector. If you take antibiotics, you're at risk for C. diff. 250,000 people a year are getting C. diff infections, and 13,000 of them are dying. Now, this is an unpronounceable word. I'll try to limit the number of unpronounceable words, but it's important. Carbapenemase resistant anterior bacteriaceae. Carbapenem is our most potent class of antibiotics. That's our backup drug. It's the relief pitcher. It's what we use when we have horrible infections and we have nothing else to use, but now bacteria are resistant to that too. So in 2001, the first case of carbapenemase resistant enterobacteriaceae was reported in North Carolina. Remember, these are very common organisms, and they pass resistance among each other. In not even a decade, it's now in almost every state in the country. This is a huge problem. It's not just in the United States. It's all across the world. It's just a plane flight away. So these incredibly resistant organisms are being transmitted in India, Eastern Europe, China, and then transmitted to the United Kingdom, to the United States, to Canada. And it only takes a plane flight. So here's a real example. I get phone calls and emails every day from doctors all across the country asking for help to treat these resistant infections. This was a 70-year-old woman in good health who went on a, a cruise in Eastern Europe. She fell and broke her hip, so they had to do a hip replacement. But she came back from her vacation with more than she bargained for. She got an incredibly drug-resistant in infection in her hip, and so the doctors now here in the United States are struggling to save her hip, her leg, her life. They're using antibiotics from decades ago that we gave up because they were so toxic. And now we're using them again, and we're pulling everything out and combining them with new drugs at incredible doses just trying to be able to effectively treat her. 
So why can't we just make new antibiotics? What's the big deal? We've done it before. So from the 1940s to the 1980s, we were really good at manufacturing new antibiotics. This is the United States. We're creative, we're innovative. But since the 1980s, there are almost no new drugs being developed. There's incredible pressure against manufacturers, difficulties to do this. So the pipeline is dry. We don't have any new antibiotics. So we have to do something completely different. We have to focus on prevention. And hospitals have been working very hard for the past decade to do that. They've focused on improving hand hygiene, using antibiotics appropriately, rigorously training healthcare workers to do aseptic technique, and it's made a huge difference. We've reduced ventilator-associated pneumonia, surgical site infections, bloodstream infections in hospitals, which is very, very important. And I hope you didn't pay a lot of money to come in here and hear me tell you hand washing is still the most important thing. So it makes a difference. Both alcohol hand gels work very effectively as well as soap and water. Now there's some other good news also. The CDC and other agencies have been working on doctors and patients to reduce the use of antibiotics for things that don't need antibiotics. Viral infections, ear infections, colds, bronchitis, that kind of thing. But we're a long way from where we need to be. We need to use a lot fewer antibiotics. So now we have partnerships between veterinarians, doctors, and patients. There's a national action plan that's calling for federal agencies, specialty societies to all work together to focus on improving public health infrastructure, tracking resistance, tracking antibiotic use, reducing antibiotic consumption in our livestock, improving food safety, but also training doctors and patients how to use antibiotics more effectively and making new antibiotics and new diagnostic tests so we can tell when you have a bacterial infection, when you have a resistant infection, when you really need antibiotics and when you don't need antibiotics. So, in summary, in honor of David Letterman, I just had to give you my own top 10 list. <laughs> Ways you can make a difference. Get vaccinated, prevent infections in the first place. Don't ask for antibiotics. I get calls every week begging for antibiotics. The color of your snot or your mucus does not mean you need antibiotics. If someone prescribes antibiotics for you, Ask them if you really need antibiotics. And choose antibiotic-free foods whenever you can. Prepare food safely to minimize the risk of cross-transmission. And stay home when you're sick so you don't pass infections to your colleagues or your other kids at school. Practice cough hygiene, so cover your nose and mouth when you cough or you sneeze. And I cannot say loud enough or often enough, wash your hands frequently. Teach your kids to wash their hands. Remind others to wash their hands. <laughs> Ask your doctor and your nurse if they've washed their hands before they touch you or one of your loved ones. It could save your life. If not, if we don't protect this incredibly valuable resource of antibiotics, we could be thrown into the pre-antibiotic era. This was a four-year-old girl who had a trivial scratch, developed staph sepsis, was on death's door, and penicillin saved her life. She lived to her 70s. She saw her children and grandchildren grow up, and we're going to lose all of that if we don't take the call to action, change the way we use antibiotics, and protect future generations. So I pledge to always use antibiotics appropriately and safely. That means the right drug at the right time, the right dose, and the right duration. I hope you'll take the pledge too, and ask your doctors to take the pledge. Thank you very much.